Hey guys, today as you heard from this first part of this video, we have a very unhappy mini Moog that we're working on today. And uh, this is actually a mini Moog that we're just focusing just right now on revival. So we're not really focusing on any kind of restoration work at this point. We're just trying to see if this thing's even going to be worth uh, restoring. That's kind of where we're at with it. But uh, this mini Moog, mini -Moog belongs to Nilish. So Nilish, a uh, video for you so you can actually kind of follow along with the adventure here. And he basically sent it to me with the same concerns. Hey, is this thing even worth restoring or is it even fixable? I think that was the big question that we both kind of had. He had another tech look at it. And of course, he pretty much just wrote it off going, I'm not touching that thing at all. <laughs> so, so I ended up with it here. But um, I've kind of got it working. As you can see, since the first part of the video, I've already started taking it apart. Uh, mostly just cleaning pots because it had a lot of pots that did nothing. And that's part of the process here is I have to figure out what's a potentiometer issue and then what's a circuit issue. Because sometimes, you know, a circuit issue can uh, behave just like a dirty pot. In this case, we've got a mixture of things that are both. So we have some, some pots that are problems as well as some circuitry that's showing up as some issues. Um, but when this thing came in, it was dead on arrival. It, had, it made no noise. Um, you know, it would not even make 440 hertz. It powers up, you get the pot light but that was it um, and of course when it came in it was missing the fuse holder for the uh, plus 10 volts here so I had to put a fuse uh, new fuse holder on it because that was broken off put the right kind of fuses in it to make sure the fuses are right of course you can see I've still got a rotten cord but it's not the insulation on the wire is still there so I'm not real worried about it um, so I had to start there getting it to where I could power it up and then um, I found out real quickly that nothing worked. I could see that we're getting uh, trigger from the keyboard. We're getting CV from the keyboard. And so I hooked my scope up to the filter output. I could see that the filter emphasis and everything was working. I could see that we're getting some frequency from the oscillators. Uh, not perfect frequency, but we could at least get something. But once it got to the VCA section, it was gone. It was uh, actually on the VCA side. So it had a, a dead VCA which I found out uh, that it had some cracked solder joints and some corroded solder joints. So some things just had to be you know, cleaned up, reflowed, and then uh, got all that fixed. So it came alive. So that's really about it. Cracked solder joints and uh, you know, just trying to get some of the corrosion off the circuit board that where it wouldn't take solder. So that was the biggest part. So we got that fixed. We got the 440 hertz working, and then I could actually you know, kind of get it to make some noise, as you heard in that video. But um, now I'm just kind of trying to get it to be more musical. And as you can hear, I'll let you hear this thing. We do actually have... It's not perfect. But we can actually adjust the frequency now. So as you can hear, it does actually produce sound now, which is, is great. We still got some pots that are, are they may have to be replaced because I cleaned them and I have to literally take them apart because they're Allen Bradley pots, they're sealed, so I have to heat them up, take them apart. And uh, what's nice about Allen Bradley though is you can actually clean them and they're actually self-cleaning. A lot of people don't know that. But what you do to self-clean these things, like if you got just a little noise in one of your pots, what you can do is typically take your knob and while you twist it, pull out on it and you can actually rock it back and forth in that spot that's got a bad, you know, spot in it. And sometimes it'll clean up as long as your as long as your carbon wiper and the carbon track are okay. But these actually do use a carbon wiper, so it's not a metal wiper against carbon. It's actually carbon against uh, the carbon inside the the uh, the track. So you can actually clean these things like that. Um, but in cases when they get really worn, you can take them apart. And sometimes what happens is you just get some of the carbon powder in there off the wiper. And you have to just get it out of the way. So you have to flush it, clean it, and then you're good. So sometimes that works. Sometimes in a case like this, when you got a lot of corrosion, a lot of water damage, um, sometimes the, the, there's just so, so much oxidation and stuff that forms on that carbon that you can't do much with it. Um, and that, that's a problem, I think, we're having with this one. So there's going to be a few pots i got to replace in it. Um, but, you know, this is part of the process of bringing these things back alive. 
So, quick question for you guys. I'm going to give you guys a test here based off all my other videos I've post. What year do you think this Mini Moog is? Just by looking at it. I'll tell you at the end. But we got, just for reference, we got a, a metal backed vinyl interface with the embossed leather. We got the uh, badge here with the, with the uh, hard corners. Metal backed vinyl with embossed leather. Um, what year do you guys think this is from? Just based off all that. So I'll come back to that here at the end. Because this is an oddball mini mode, and I'll be explaining that uh, at the end of the video here. But anyway, just give you guys a good look at uh, some of the damages to this unit. So this thing, first of all, when I got it out of the ATA case, which by the way, it was rusty as well. The ATA case was just about as rusty as the mini Moog. Um, there's no hardware in this thing. So the LHC panel was loose. It was just kind of floating there. The keyboard is bolted on this end, but as you can see down here, which you kind of heard by the clank of the keys, this keyboard is not mounted down here and it's missing the spacer that goes between the keyboard and the chassis. So that's the problem. So I'll be cutting you spacers and, and fixing all that up as well. I bring around back here and just kind of show you some of the corrosion here. So right here you can see that we got a lot of corrosion there. Another hint to what year this Mini Moog is. Um, but you can also see too the ATA case gassed out and it's stuck to the wood. So this thing will need to be, you know, cleaned up and the way I explain the smell of these things, because these things do reek, uh, not just by the moisture, uh, but also by the ATA case foam. It gasses out when it when it uh, disintegrates, and it almost smells like cow manure. That's the only thing I know that comes close to that smell. It's a very earthy, kind of weird smell to it, it has. But um, bring it around back here, you can kind of see we got a version 2 oscillator board. And then we got the uh, filter board and a power supply back here. And of course, although this thing's had water damage, the wood's actually still pretty good. It's a little discolored, but uh, it's, it's in pretty decent shape. Once again, we got the, the, bag, the badge on the back that's metal with vinyl overlay. Got to cut a new under chassis for it. The under chassis has actually been wet. You can see down there and it's all swollen and busted apart. And... Uh, of course, that's on that corner I was just showing you, which is the corner I was really worried about the most, but I don't see any rod in it, so that's great. It's just got discoloration. So I think a good sanding and good, you know, good staining will take care of all of that. But um, just kind of bring you on around here and kind of see how the end panels are. Once again, we got some of that, some rough edges and, and stuff that stuck to it. Um, but you know we're you know we're making progress. This is part of the uh, journey of bringing these things back alive. As you, you have to start somewhere and, and work your way to it. All right. So now I'm going to start giving you guys the details. So if you said 1973, you would actually technically be correct uh, based off the information I gave you. If you said 74, you'd be correct because it has the switch for the transformer primary windings series of parallel to give you 15 115 or uh, 230 volts so it's actually a 74 mini Moog but this is a very very odd unit and I'm going to explain this actually even goes against my history lesson that I've had uh, over the years of just studying these in instruments this is one of those weird examples of that not everything follows the production and I'm going to show you what I mean by that so it's a 74 Mini Moog, but first thing for you guys that know my other videos, another little test for you. Do you see something missing on this top panel here? We don't have those two screws up here, which hold the buffer board. So this one does not have the buffer board for the octave switch. And that was something that I thought happened right in January of 74. I thought they carried that right into January of 74, but clearly not. This unit was built on February 18th, 1974. So it's a February 18th, 1974 Mini Moog. Seal number 4198. It's actually, I don't know if you can see that or not. It's kind of hard to see on camera. But there's a 4198. And of course, once again, you see all the rust and corro corrosion and stuff. Excuse me. All the corrosion and stuff going on here. But, um, you know, it's just kind of what it is there. So it's got that. So also what else happened in 74, which I thought, 
um, all the boards would be uh, labeled Moog. So, you know, they were really called RA Moog Incorporated, and then when they did the revisions to all the circuitry, they put the Moog Music badge uh, and Moog branding on the actual circuit boards, uh, you know, numbers. Well, this one does have Moog circuit boards. So the oscillator board's Moog, the backboard's labeled Moog, the power supply's Moog, but we get into this filter board right here which is an RA Moog board. And the easy giveaway, for those that are curious, we got a CTS trimmer here for the scale of the filter. In 74, they start putting a rheostat right here, just like these right here. Now, from my study on this unit, the buffer board being not being there, that's odd. But I believe this board's from a different unit. And the reason I say that is, real simply, I can take the back cover here, which wasn't even bolted on either. It was missing all the hardware. You can see there's three holes. So we got the hole right there, that hole, and that hole there for calibration points. That third hole, or that, that center hole right there, would have been for the scale. So you only find that hole on instruments with the rheostat because you cannot calibrate the CTS part externally because it's turned sideways, which was also a problem with trying to get your filter tracking in correctly because the minute you put the cover on your thermal accuracy changes and you change the scaling so that was always an issue with this particular design but it sounds great this filter is great sounding yeah another issue too where this uh, trim pot would get bumped by the back cover and it'd crack the solder joints and break it off the solder joints so you'd have a filter that was that was dead that was also a real common thing that would happen so yeah there's some oddities there but there's also another real weird oddity and I think this board may be from the same mini Moog that the LHC came from. So when, Le when uh, Lish was showing me what he had, he sent me some pictures. He sent me a picture of this, which threw me off because in 74, you don't see these stickers. Uh, this is the early style sticker, and I don't even think you really see them that much in 73. In 73, I think these stickers were just about to go away because Norlin had already kind of started, you know, making some changes. You'd see the yellow sticker, the QA and the QC sticker, quality control sticker, but you wouldn't see this style sticker much anymore. Well, this was glued to the LHC. If we look at the dates on this, you can actually see here, so I can get it to focus. Come on, focus. This camera's having a real hard time focusing today for some reason. There it is. If we look, it's 11 30 72. So November 30th, 1972 is when this thing had the electrical test done. So that's this is from a 72 mini Moog, which is very odd. So I think the filter board and this is from a different unit, just come from what I'm getting, because I know for a fact these were not used in this era. But not having the buffer board, that's odd. That's odd. That's a new one for me. So that's kind of interesting. Uh, but once again, some of the corrosion, you can see this LHC, the Sense Jones connector, how corroded it is. It's actually seized together. I can't even get it apart. Um, so that'll be replaced. I'll be cutting all those, har those the harness off. I'll just cut them. Fresh solder joint, fresh wire, uh, clean everything up. Also, I've got some, some Sense Jones jacks that are newer, a little bit different style, but they, they work better. So I'll be replacing that. And of course, right now you can see I've got the pitch wheel out and I've just got it hardwired here for top frequency. So if you had the wheel turned all the way up, I've just got it fixed to the highest frequency because the oscillators do have a problem as well. And uh, trying to eliminate things that cause erratic frequency. So uh, just doing stuff like that. Also clean the pot. That's the pot I showed you earlier. So yeah, that's where we are so far with this unit. So lots to, lots to take in, lots to go on. But... Uh, you know, making progress, this is how you do it. But um, anyways, guys, I'll bring you along on the adventure. We've we got a lot to do here, but I'll try to bring you guys in a little bit more than I usually do here. All right, I'm jumping around a little bit here, <clears throat> but uh, just sanded out the chassis here and uh, just done a rough sanding and getting the uh, some of the cracks and stuff filled a little bit. It will be sanded out. Nothing major wrong with this chassis. It's actually still in pretty good shape. But mostly just getting rid of the uh, stain where it was damaged by the ATA case foam and also uh, where it had got a little damp. So just kind of getting the wood back down so I can clean it up real good. Hadn't sanded the top piece yet. As you can see, some of the damages like right there. And of course the foam is still attached to the wood here on the top side. 
So that's kind of the reason we're sanding this one out and going to refinish it so it'll look just as great as it's going to sound. But there's the uh, guts over there. I rebuilt the keyboard assembly. Haven't done alignment yet, but just rebuilt that. Uh, got the interface all removed, and uh, we're making progress here. But just going to give you a little update here before I start uh, doing the final sanding and getting it prepped for uh, for our stain and, and urethane here. All right, so I just finished sanding everything out for our final sanding here. And what you see now is actually a pre-stain conditioner. And this allows the stain, when I get ready to stain it, to actually uh, absorb into the wood. So this is kind of just a look at how I do these uh, these cabinets. And so this just really helps just to make everything adhere really good so you don't have any like bubbles or any spots that it's missed uh, on this older wood when you apply the stain. That's really the point. But it also gives me a good visual so I can kind of see how the wood grain is going to look uh, before we do anything. I can just kind of get a good idea of it. But uh, you can just see it's going to be a pretty cabinet when I'm done with it. You let this stuff set on there for about 15-20 minutes. Wipe it off. And then it's ready for uh, for a stain. We got the insides. Don't worry about the you know internals as much, but mostly just focus on the outer side. When you lift the panel up, everything looks uniform around it. Yeah. So this is where I was kind of concerned about the water damage down here. You can see a little discoloration in that wood, but it's not bad. So I'm very confident this thing's going to be just fine. Somebody has repaired this one in the past though, because when I started sanding it, I found there's some nails, which these things didn't have nails originally. And uh, so there's there's nails in there. But you can also see some of the uh, uh, filler I put in there just to kind of fill some of these little spots that have little nicks and stuff. Sanded back most of what I could, but that just kind of helps take care of some of those little nicks and things and dings and that kind of stuff you really can't just sand out. And also just some of the little small cracks like that you get in this early early wood. Because these end chicks are a lot thinner, as I've mentioned before. So they tend to crack right there in those areas. But um, anyways, I'm going to let this stay down here a few more minutes and then I'm going to start the stain process. Alright, it's a few days later here and I've got the stain done and the urethane done. You can just kind of see how beautiful this chassis is going to look when we have it all back together. You can see all this beautiful wood grain. And it's well protected. I use a semi-gloss uh, urethane. And it just turns out very, very pretty. As you can see. All the way across. It's almost a glass-like finish here. And every time I do these, I learn a little bit different process just from you know experience doing these things on how I want to do the urethane. Because the urethane is tricky. Um, so it does take a little while to learn how to do it. But you can see just how great everything looks. Across here, all the beautiful wood grain. All the way down. So from what this thing did look like, it's a major difference in how this Mimo is going to look. Let's get in the wood down this way as well. Now you will still see like the nails that were in this chassis. Somebody had repaired it. I just left those in there. That's one reason I didn't take this thing apart uh, to actually restain this one. But uh, just kind of walk you on around here, let you see this thing. Here's the back of it. Actually, I'm going to go from this angle in the back because I think the lighting will be better that way. Yeah, there you go. Now you can see all the grain down this way here. And of course, I filled in most of the little cracks and stuff I had, like right here. So we had a crack right there. But you can see, uh, you still see it a little bit, but I did fill it and I stained the filler. So everything kind of looks uniform there. As close as I could get it. I mean, we are still dealing with a vintage chassis. So there's some marks and scuffs and dents and, you know, some stuff I had to kind of work out of this thing. But once again, I don't do the inside all the way. I do the, uh, I do redo this parts where you see it when you lift it up. But I don't worry about, you know, restaining the whole inside cabinet. But, um... Just mainly the outer where your keyboard sets and your LHC, so you can kind of see how that looks. But also, I just show you what this thing originally looked like. So, here's once again the comparison of the original color. So, I had this nasty, here's that foam mess where it attached to it in the uh, case. This has still got to be sanded and cleaned up. But you can see the coloration, it's a little darker, but we did pretty close to match it. In fact, it looks a little bit better than this. But, um, I'll be sanding this out next and 
the same treatment. It's just easier to handle things one at a time. I found out through doing these things. When you're trying to do everything at the same time, it can get a little chaotic. Um, I'll be saying that as well, and I'll just be getting the same treatment as I did the chassis here. But anyways, I'm gonna move on here. All right, with the woodwork all finished up, I've now turned my attention back to the unit here and uh, getting this thing all prepped up, ready to do the delamination on the interface panel. But also, I went on to replace the power cord, as you can see. I've updated the Sense Jones connectors. I've replaced the one for the keyboard with the new old stock. I upgraded the one for the LHC, or left-hand control. This is a modern Sense Jones that you can still buy, and they actually work very well. And uh, you can see I've also updated the LHC over here, the left-hand control for it as well. Cleaned the standoffs really good because they were oxidized really bad. And of course that brings me in why I replaced that connector. So here's, here's the original Sense Jones connector and you can see just from the corrosion on it that uh, there was really no saving this thing. Um, sometimes when they got a little oxidation I can polish them out and they're fine. Not in this case. I can already tell you just by how the corrosion is if I start polishing this one that we're going to lose the plating and then you're going to have just you know a headache of problems. So I went on to replace that, replace the female as well. But you can see it looks a little bit different than the one I replaced. It's got a little smaller profile. But the pinout, I keep the pinout exactly the same. So if it's pin 1 on this one, it's pin 1 on this one. So you can still troubleshoot it just like an, uh, a Mini Moog with this original Sense Jones. I don't change anything about the pinout. All I do is just change just that. So it makes things a little bit easier there. But... Um, Anyways, just thought you guys would like to see this update here. Also, I found a date code on this thing. So this is October 3rd, 1973 when this was inspected by W, by the Duralith Corporation who made these interfaces for Moog. And once again, it's got a 73 era interface panel, even though it's a 74. So it's got the embossed leather, vinyl, metal backed. And uh, in 74, you typically see it where it's just a vinyl. So it's just a vinyl piece, and those are the ones that like to shrink and bend out and warp and all that kind of stuff. But uh, these are pretty durable here. They hold up pretty good. But the delamination on this one really isn't that bad. You can see there's not a lot of bubbling in it, but it's starting to turn white. And because it's turning white, when you put it against the beautiful woodwork I just finished, it looks ugly. So that's why we're, we're doing this. So I can just make it look as great as it's going to sound and it's going to make everything just look really good at the in the final results here. I'll show you here how it looks when I'm delaminating these panels here. So you can see this is uh, the, the laminate surface I'm pulling off. You can see where I've got to here. That's kind of where it's still white. I take that off. You can see now it's starting to look black, but it's still dirty. We still got a lot of the glues and stuff adhered to it. So that's half the battle. Is yeah, so once we get this off, we got to get this glues off. But uh, you can just kind of see the process here. And once again, what I do is I take a heat gun, like so, and I'll set on a low setting, and I'll just kind of heat this up. I'll do a preheat first, so I'll go over this panel, just kind of get it kind of warm, nothing hot. You don't want to you don't want to melt this thing, but you just want to get it kind of warm to the touch, so it's got some heat in it. And then what you do is you just take your heat gun and you just go back and forth while you pull this up behind it. You heat it back here while you lift up, and it'll come off slowly. Probably the hardest part of this process is getting you a corner started. And of course you can see this one already had some nicks in this corner. So we had a little nick right there, which I actually I was able to grab it right there at that corner because it already had been broken at the glue surface just from that nick. We've got a few nicks in this panel. So you can see there's one right there as well. But you can actually kind of see, so if, I'm going to see if I can zoom in here and show you. You can see that laminate panel right there has actually peeled up. So that's kind of what I look for. I look for some place, most at a corner. It's going to be easier to start at a corner when you do this process. And if you have one that's not all ripped up, it's, it makes it even easier because you can just continue to flow and pull rather than have to stop and you might have to just break off and then you have to start somewhere else. So heat's very critical. You don't want too much heat. You want enough heat to heat this up. But if, it's, if you feel this right here starting to melt, then you've got way too much heat. So you just want it to where it just pulls loose. That's the key. But anyways, I'm going to finish removing this, and uh, we'll see how it looks when I'm done here. All right, we now have this mini mug all complete here. And as you can see, it looks way different than it did when we started with this thing. It's a much different instrument than it was. Um, but as you guys have seen the process of uh, getting the stain and all that done to the cabinet, 
as well as the interface delamination removal, but now you can see it without the laminate. So this is a look at it without all the glues and how sharp everything looks and how dark and crisp. You know, everything looks besides the uh, kind of white haze look. But I installed all new knobs on this one as well. So these are all brand new knobs. And so they just look just as great as the unit. When I redid all this, the knobs he had was really corroded. They, you know, the uh, little metal inserts were all corroded. And a lot of knobs were missing. So we had an issue just with missing knobs. And so this was a good way just to clean all that up, make it look just as great as everything else on the unit. I also redid this top piece of wood, which you had not seen yet. I did it outside the chassis. As mentioned, I do these things in parts because it's easier to focus on different pieces at a time rather than do it all at one time. Delaminated the Moog badge here as well. So I got rid of the laminate so it's the same color as the interface. I rebuilt the keyboard assembly so it's all been rebuilt. I uh, actually had to wet sand some of the keys because it had a, a pink, like a pink color on it and uh, wouldn't come off so I ended up sanding out the pink color. Got some deeper uh, stains there but uh, nothing I could do for that. But did get it cleaned up, got everything looking really uniform across the keyboard as far as coloration goes. And uh, just very happy with everything about this instrument. I also delaminated the LHC panel, as you can see, so I removed the laminate from it. Cleaned everything up really good there. And so it's just uh, it's a great unit. But uh, this one also had a lot of problems circuitry-wise, which I hadn't gone over yet. Uh, we had a bunch of failure. Uh, Actually, I don't believe it's ever worked right. And the reason I say that is because this was an era when Moog had switched to Motorola transistors and they tend to pull more current. And so what happens is it's hard to keep your oscillators in tune for the reason that if you turn your attack up, so, so if we set the attack you know, above uh, zero and hit a key and it, as it builds up with the attack, you'll actually get detuning in the oscillator too. It's really weird. It's a really weird... Uh, scenario that it gives you a symptom but it's because those transistors pull more current so replace those transistors put in a new set of transistors and uh, took care of that we had issues with oscillator one so oscillator one actually was missing all the pulse waves so anything square etc here would not work and so i checked the uh, rotary switch it was okay the voltage divider circuitry for making your pulse widths was okay but it was actually in the oscillator board itself. We had a shorted transistor in the actual oscillator circuitry for wave shape. So that was a problem there. As bad as this thing was, I only had to replace one potentiometer. Uh, I was able to clean up all the potentiometers. I took them all apart and flushed them, cleaned them really good. But oscillator 3 uh, frequency right here was actually uh, damaged. It had a little small hairpin crack in the carbon. And so it was causing a dead dead spot uh, in one little area. So I just had to replace that pot all together with a good replacement. So I did that. And uh, that was really it. So I just spent a lot of time cleaning this unit. Lots of time cleaning it. Um, and of course, went through all the circuit boards, did all the stuff I typically do these things, you know, to pre uh, prevent problems. Did some upgrades in places to really uh, bring in this thing into a... Uh, much more reliable instrument. Um, so it's just a really great mini mode. But I'll give you a walk around here. You guys have already seen kind of the wood cabinet, but not as a complete instrument here. So I'll just kind of show it again here. But clean the back, uh, back panel really good. Cleaned all this up really good. So now I can get rid of all that, that rust around these jacks here. Uh, all new hardware throughout the unit because it was missing, for the keyboard, it was actually missing the uh, spacers for our one side. It was missing all the hardware for the keyboard. There's one screw holding the keyboard in place. So uh, all new hardware in the keyboard, all new hardware in the LAC. The LAC was just floating. And of course this panel fell off as soon as I took it out of the ATA case because there's no screws in it. But once again, this is your cylinder, Neelish. So I'll show you this real quick. 4198 is your seal number. And so you can just kind of see how clean everything looks. Brand new power cord. So we got a new power cord on it, as you guys have seen earlier. But really just cleaned everything up. Got a new under chassis in it. Uh, this is actually a piece of plywood, so it's not the old particle board stuff. Um, new foam pieces that the interface sets on when you close it, so everything sets nice and uniform. 
And of course, once again, you can see this upper piece of wood, which was very ugly earlier on. You can see it no longer has that uh, foam attached to it from the ATA case. So sanded all that back and got all that cleaned up. Just looks really, really good all the way around. Cleaned everything up over here in this corner here. But uh, like I say, once again, just the wood. The wood looks really good. One thing I did have to do, and I'll bring you back around here and show you. I did have to replace one of your Moog badges. This one right here in particular. So I started doing the delamination process of it because it had the same haze to it. And uh, when I heated it up, it fell apart. And so what had happened, it had been cracked before. And uh, when I heated up, the glues turned loose off the actual plastic that was uh, bonded to the aluminum. And so it just kind of fell apart on me. So in that process, I just uh, had this badge here I gave you. And it's actually a really nice looking badge. It's actually a, uh, makes it like a 72 mini Moog because it's a, like an, like a, what would it be an acid etched badge? It has a very similar style. It's actually screen printed around the Moog logo rather than the Moog logo being screen printed. So it makes it have that acid etched look. It looks really good there. So I did that for you. Of course, got your prop all cleaned up. And, uh, yeah, just really happy with it. Once again, replace that fuse holder. That's where we started with this thing. I was just trying to get it to work. So that was part of the adventure there. But um, anyways, let me put the camera on the tripod here and I'll give you guys a sound demo. All right, guys, I'm first going to start by showing you a sound with everything kind of combined. Just a instrument sound that I'll break it down like I typically do. All oscillators, the filter, etc. here. But here's just a good sound of it. So anyway, as you can hear, this thing sounds really good. That's just kind of a mixture of the oscillators and filter there. I open this filter up now and I'm going to th go through each oscillators for you. Get this envelope set up here. I got a slow attack. Um, so oscillator one only. So as I mentioned, oscillator one had an issue with the uh, pulse waves. So I'll show you all that's working now. Start uh, set everything up the same way. So I'll go through the footages as well as the waveforms. I also changed all the resistors in the footage circuit, the voltage dividers, so we've got accurate uh, footages across the whole range of all three oscillators. So it really makes this thing nice and tight. But uh, here's the uh, sawtooth. Get this thing set up where it'll sustain for me. Clean the volume pots as well. There's oscillator one, here's oscillator two. Same thing there, good clean volume pot. Here's oscillator three. volume put there as well and now I'll show you that your uh, uh, frequency detunes work so we'll start with oscillator uh, 3 this is the one I replaced the pot in so 
So there's oscillator three, here's oscillator two. So they are, and you hear how even I can get them across the footages. I also show you the interaction between the footages of all three oscillators. So here the oscillators are working great. We've also got the noise source. So I'll turn the oscillators back off here. Here's the noise source. Good clean volume there as well. As you can hear. So there's your oscillators, your noise source. Now we'll turn our attention to the filter. So I've got the, I'll set the filter up to self oscillate. And we'll actually tune it to the 440 hertz reference and I'll show you it tracks the keyboard. Turn it off. And that's just the filter. We can go up a frequency range. And like I say, these early filters are not exactly accurate because once you close it up, you can't calibrate the scale. So it makes it a little bit more tricky to uh, get the filter exactly right, but you can hear it's really, really close. Of course, I can turn the uh, key tracking off altogether. It's just gonna be uh, just a fixed frequency. As you can see, we'll hit uh, keyboard control one. Turn that off, turn uh, control one, uh, control two on. When they're combined though, so you get full tracking. So that's working like it should. So that's your filter. And of course you can hear the wide range of You know how clean that pot is there. And so now we'll actually, I'll show you that the uh, contour works. So bring this filter down in frequency. We'll set everything to zero in the uh, filter contour. I'll bring out the mounted contour. And here it's just a, just a click right now. So now we'll bring up the decay. Of course, we can adjust how much of that with the amount of contour. So there's your decay time, we got the attack time. you can hear. And then we got the sustain level which sets how low the decay actually goes. So you can it doesn't go all the way back. We put a little decay on that. See it drops all the way to zero. Of 
to put key tracking on. So you can hear how that works. So that's your uh, uh, contour for your filter. So now open this filter back up here. I'll turn the oscillators back on here. And I'll show you that your loudness control works. So I'll actually go up in frequency a little bit here. So we'll set this uh, loudness control to have zero. So this is going to be a click, as you can hear. So we'll bring up the decay time. So you can see the decay time works. I'll we'll bring it back to zero. Now bring up the attack. As you can hear. So as your attack, then we got the same thing. We got the sustain level. As you get this kind of percussive. Anyways, you can hear that works. So we're back to a click because I got the case set at zero again. So there's your loudness control. We've also got the 440 hertz, which you've already, already heard. There's your 440 hertz. Then we got the modulation section. So I'll go over here and I'll make, uh, I'll make oscillator three, a LFO source, no tracking keyboard. We'll put it into the oscillators here and I'll show you how this works. Here we can gauge it to the oscillators or the filter. So we'll close this filter up a little bit. Because we can also put key tracking back on oscillator three. Yeah, it slows down depending on where you're at at the keyboard. So that's your modulation. We've also can uh, inject noise into this using the, this modulation mix. So we'll keep the wheel up here. I'm going to inject it into the oscillators first. So let me actually get oscillator uh, three set back up. So now I'm going to turn this over to noise. I'm changing between pink and white noise. So that's it into the oscillators. It's more impressive into the filter. So if we go here and close this filter up.
because we can make the Mean Mug talk. So they're just talking. You can kind of hear the frequency modulation kind of tricks you can do there. Of course, that's running Oscillator 3 as an audio source. And also, back to the oscillators real quick, since I've mentioned the uh, modulation section, I'll show you too that I've done the dead zone mod to this mini mode, so the pitch wheel will be accurate. So when you return it to the detent, it's actually zero volts. So it makes the oscillators a much more stable, keeps you from having sharps and flats when you use the wheel. <laughs> As you can see, if I use just one oscillator, you'll hear it. When I wiggle it in the detent, there's no tuning. It doesn't affect it till I get outside the detent. So it's a really handy uh, modification there, especially if you use the wheel a lot. So that's uh, pretty much this mini Moog. I will show you too the uh, glide works. So also we do have the switch here too, uh, which is decay. So that actually uh, works with your envelope generators or controls. So you can see when I have it on, we have a uh, continued decay time. Turn it off, I, it, it goes away. So. So that all works like it's supposed to. Also, I will show you too, because I mentioned those transistors that was recalled, I'll show you this, it has no effect on the oscillators. So I've set a slow attack for both the loudness and the filter. I'll close this filter up a little bit. Okay, I gotta turn the oscillator back on there. tune now. I set them back to zero so you can see it on the effect of the tuning. I had just knocked this out because I was using it for LFO. So there's our, there's our oscillators. Now I'm going to bring up the attack. I'll show you it doesn't affect tuning anymore. As you can see, we have no effect in tuning now when you use both attacks. Also, you got your glide. So anyways, as you can hear, this mini mode works fantastic now. It's a great playing unit. And uh, once again, I want to give you a uh, really good shout out here, Nilish, for letting me restore this thing for you. And for you guys that watch my videos, really do appreciate it. And there'll be more here to come here very soon. But uh, everybody take care and talk to you soon.